how to hypothesize and then confirm dysphagia with an instrumental exam. SLPs know that instrumental assessments are important, but how do we know what to do and when? It's just as important that we know when we are not needed and when we need to refer patients elsewhere. That's all part of the skilled services that we're trained to do. In this video, we'll talk about why we might not be needed, how we screen for dysphagia, and then how to determine which assessment might be warranted for your patient. And it might not be a dysphagia assessment. Let's dive in. I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist for 15 years. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I'm the founder and CEO of the MedSLP Collective and MedSLP Education. So often our referrals for swallowing sound exactly the same and they may all tend to blur together. Whether in a hospital, skilled nursing setting, or home health, the referrals for patients with swallowing trouble can all sound very similar. The patient says it's hard to swallow while eating. The patient complains that food won't go down right. The patient stopped eating because they say they cough too much and eating is too tiring. The patient has lost so much weight and we need their swallowing screened ASAP. The patient has just stopped eating and says they aren't ever hungry. These are all lines that we've all heard over and over and over again. We're SLPs, we're not trained monkeys. Even though we hear the same lines over and over about our patients does not mean that they all will receive the same diagnostic tests. We're trained to do better, and once we know better, we do better. So where do we start? Screen out those that don't need our intervention. That's right, not every patient might need us. It's shocking. Let me say that again. Not every patient needs dysphagia intervention, compensation, exercises, or really any intervention from speech therapy at all. So we typically can pick those out of the mix of referrals with screenings and comprehensive clinical swallowing evaluations. Our goal anytime we screen and or assess is to start the process of hypothesizing where to go with our next move, which instrumentals to suggest, which specialty to bring aboard with us for further diagnostics. We are the dysphagia detectives, but it's equally important for us to know when not to get involved and refer patients to the right place for the right treatment at the right time. We have to be very familiar with testing options, not just those within our clinical domain or scope. For example, what does the GI doctor do? Do you have a good relationship with a GI practice in your area? What would an ENT do? Where is a good allergist or the best neurologist or neurosurgeon? These are the types of things that we need to be very aware of as we evaluate our patients. As you become more comfortable in your setting in your area, start establishing these relationships. Your facility may already have a sister facility or practice that they want you to refer patients to, or it may be up to you to research some options for your patients. Early in my career, I didn't know as much about esophageal dysphagia as I do now. I now know different signs and symptoms to look for, and when we get involved, and more importantly, when we don't. I had a patient that had the typical complaints of difficulty swallowing, food getting stuck, nursing reported coughing, choking at meals. After doing a quick chart review, he had an extensive history of esophageal disorders and his recent follow-up appointment for an esophageal dilatation had been canceled while he was in the hospital. We ended up contacting his GI and getting him set back up for the procedure. The GI thanked us because it was really severe and after that, he was back to eating and drinking just fine. That case really stuck with me because I think of so many times we just treat the dysphagia because it's what we think we have to do. And we could have put this poor person through exercises or strategies the whole nine yards. But once I've gotten more knowledgeable about collaborating with other professionals, it's helped me be a lot more efficient with my time. I'll be posting other videos just like this one that you won't wanna miss. So make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. Also, do you have any specific questions about how to hypothesize and confirm dysphagia with an instrumental exam? Leave a comment below and tell me about it. We'll be sure to get your questions answered as soon as possible. Number two, screen the patient using a valid tool like the Yale and then follow up with a clinical evaluation. So where does the dysphagia identification process begin? It starts by recognition from staff that something is wrong or off about how the patient is eating or swallowing. This is typically followed with a formal request to screen the patient for dysphagia or for a particular feeding difficulty. It's important to understand how screens work in your facility and what constitutes a screen versus an evaluation. Depending on the payer source, it can impact if your facility is reimbursed or not. Now, of course, we want to do what's best for the patient and not just rely on the reimbursement, but understanding the billing can help a lot. Now, how do we do a screen? 
The simplest way is to implement a tool like the Yale three ounce water screen. Just be careful with the populations you choose for the Yale as there is evidence that it is not appropriate for use with those in post-operative cardiac recovery units. If you work in a setting where screenings are hands off, which is typical in skilled nursing, then you can incorporate the Yale as part of the evaluation process. The clinical swallow exam should be inclusive of all elements possible to collect outside of more invasive tests like the video fluoroscopy or a fees. And if you stick around long enough, we have a gift to give you with our entire clinical swallow exam template in it. The point of doing the comprehensive exam is to paint a picture of the patient's swallow and guide us as we decide to go further with visualizations, treatments, or referrals. Now what should that comprehensive CSE include? Body structures and systems, activity and personality participation, environmental and personal factors. We gather the information we need via chart review, general observation, interview, assessing oral care, cranial nerve examination, cough assessment, motor speech examination, quality of life questionnaires, and bolus trials if deemed necessary. While we are often reminded of the importance of instrumental assessments and that we can't treat what we don't see, there are some initial things we can do, like positioning, that might be beneficial to the patient. One recent paper I do suggest you check out is the Garand et al. paper called Assessment Across the Lifespan, the Clinical Swallow Evaluation, as it has some wonderful insights. I'll admit, earlier in my career, I thought clinical swallow evals were silly, and I thought we needed to just move right into the instrumental to just get the best bang for our buck. And although that is important, there's so much information to be gleaned from a CSE as well as feedback from the patient. I remember seeing a patient a few years back that was just a very shy and quiet man at baseline, barely socialized with other residents or staff. He was referred to SLP with complaints of coughing at mealtimes, which is a pretty typical referral for us. As I started to do the clinical swallow exam and cranial nerve exam, I noticed some pretty abnormal findings. I asked nursing if he had had any change in status or new diagnosis, and they said not to their knowledge. I reported that I was concerned, so the patient was sent for a neuro workup, and lo and behold, he had suffered a minor stroke. This was the cause for the recent onset of the coughing at meals. Noticing these hallmarks during the CSE, combined with the impairments found on fees, allowed us to have a strong case to advocate for a neuro workup. Now lastly, pick the right instrumental exam, even if an SLP will not be the one doing it. Video fluoroscopy and fees are of course our go-to examinations for concerns about oral pharyngeal dysphagia. However, most of our patients, particularly those that are elderly, will have other swallowing concerns and body system implications that need to be addressed as well. We should take the comprehensive results from our clinical swallow eval and translate them into the appropriate referrals for our patients based on symptoms and logistics. We need to learn as SLPs why we might refer for an esophagram or an EGD or even an upper GI. We should help streamline the referral process in order to save our patients time and expense. If your patient complains of reflux symptoms, send them to the GI. If your patient has throat burn and constant pain but otherwise seems to swallow fine, send them to the ENT. You found a movement disorder that occurs with the swallow, the neurologist should be consulted first for appropriate testing. You have the power to put these patients on the right path. So use it. I remember earlier in my career, I didn't know much about making proper referrals and how and when to make one. I struggled as I had a colleague that was told that she referred patients to ENT too much. Now that might've been totally warranted, I don't know, but it led me to really learn about what conditions our facility wanted us to manage on the inside through nursing and the medical director versus what referrals really constituted sending the patient out of the building, away from rehab with costly transportation, et cetera. Making relationships with the other physicians in the area, such as ENT, GI, and neuro, helped me have conversations about when the appropriate time for those referrals might be. This came to light with lots of patients being referred to an ENT for reflux. Yes, our local ENT saw the reflux patients, whereas in some places it might be the GI. Our facility came up with a plan with the medical director on how to manage patients with reflux before sending them out. This earned me even more respect in that when I made a referral to another specialist, I had strong documentation to support it, and it wasn't questioned. If you'd like to learn more about esophageal dysphagia or a clinical swallow exam template, make sure to go to www.medslpcollective.com and access your free MedSLP Collective clipboard kit. And if you'd like to join a community of MedSLPs from around the globe to share questions, challenges, and wins, and continue to grow your clinical knowledge, then I invite you to enroll in the MedSLP Collective by going to the link in the description below.